let's move on to Brianna Taylor. Um, I am surprised, I guess I shouldn't be, at how many libertarians and conservatives have bought hook, line, and sinker government propaganda around this. Um, and so what we're going to do is share an article right by Radley Balco, who is a libertarian journalist, uh, who is the best on criminal justice issues. His book, uh, The Rise of the Warrior Cop, is essential reading for any libertarian, and he wrote he works for the Washington Post. Uh, and he wrote an article called Correcting the Misinformation Around Breonna Taylor. And uh, like our, our comment section on a couple of our posts around Breonna Taylor are truly unbelievable, but I guess I shouldn't be surprised because so many people fell for the Kentucky Attorney General's BS. Like it's just plain BS. Like he literally did what Bob Barr did with like, Bill Barr did with the uh, the Mueller investigation where he come out came out and framed it and then everybody on the right just bought it as opposed to reading the Mueller report. Like the Kentucky Attorney General came out and told you what he wanted you to know and you don't like fact check it and look it up. Like he it's not that he's wrong. This is again a legal thing. It's not that he's wrong. It's not that his facts were wrong. It's not that he lied. It's that he told you half truths. He told you things that were true, but not all of the context. And so people on the right, because a black woman was killed by a police officer and the libertarian who goes, all these Republicans and Democrats are terrible. The Republicans and Democrats are destroying the system, but I'm going to def to support and defend Republicans until my dying breath are the most frustrating people on the planet. You can't sit here and tell me that the two-party system and both sides have failed and then never, ever criticize the right for anything. Mm -hmm. This Kentucky attorney general just spoke at Donald Trump's GOP convention. He's a protege of Mitch McConnell. Mr. Integrity, <laughs> right? Like, this, he, Mitch McConnell was at his wedding, which is not a sign that he's some secret racist as some of the media reports were trying to portray it. But, like, this guy is not, he is he has a political future that he cares about and he's trying to look pro police at a time when that's a popular stance on the right and so he's not telling you the truth and there's tons of reporting around it from all different sides and everybody but the the government agree is is in agreement and so the propaganda pushed by this Kentucky AG at this decision was astounding and to see everybody not even question it while they call themselves free thinkers because they don't think the virus is real, you just go, what the fuck? Um, so so I, this nothing, I was genuinely depressed when you started hearing that Louisville was setting up barriers and that the state of emergency was declared. And then that morning, kindergartens and preschools and schools were closed in Frankfurt around where the decision was going to be made. And you just like it depressed me for a couple reasons because a it meant that what was what always happens was going to happen. There wouldn't be any accountability for these officers for their actions. And you knew it would be incredibly insulting in the process. And then you knew the reaction to that was going to be small business owners and people losing their their investments, their homes, their properties, like, and you can say, oh, well, that's just money, and this was a life. It's not an and or decision. You can have empathy for the people who didn't do anything wrong and had their properties destroyed, and the people who died and lost a family member. Like, you can have empathy for everybody in the situation. Like, it was just depressing knowing. But I will say this: we get so invested in the fight between were the cops right or was the victim wrong or right and like we get into that argument and hyper focused on that moment of death and it turns into like some gr gruesome roman coliseum argument of the cops are killing them and we need to and, and like we get so focused on that we never step back and ask why were the cops there in the first place we never step back and go what is the system and and for, for my friends on the right who don't get this, that's a lot of what the protests are about. It's not that a black, not just that a black person was killed. It's that nobody ever seems to disengage from that horrible fight 
and say the laws are sm are smothering us to death. Libertarians will sit there and tell you that laws are killers. Every time you pass a law, force is used to to fight that law, but then they will sit there and defend the killers of Breonna Taylor to the death. That's again, it doesn't jive. What most of the protesters are saying is we've protested peacefully, we've elected politicians, we've done everything the right way. Nobody is listening to us. The no knock warrants, the qualified immunity, the drug war, these are the problems. That's what needs to change. And instead of going, yes, let's work on changing it, we go, no, you just need to support the police harder. Here's my black and blue flag. Now submit. And you go, what are you talking about? Like, th th we're talking past each other. You know, this is a great example of Breonna Taylor never should have, have died. These police officers never should have been facing the prospect of a charge. The, the drug laws are the problem. Society is at large saying no more drug laws. It doesn't work. Everybody's being killed and put in jail for laws that don't work. Look at Portugal. Look at Chile. When you decriminalize and legalize drugs, life gets better for everybody. There's less crimes. There's less criminals. And so, um, yeah, Henry, stay tuned. Henry says, the police knock on the door at a suspected drug house. No answer. They break open the door to gunfire. The police get to protect themselves. I'm going to explain to you why you're 100% wrong you're parroting propaganda from the government you don't know facts I, I apologize to the first secretary of war for the united states henry knox but you're wrong you just don't know what you're talking about and you don't care enough to look and that's the frustration is that you're saying this bullshit and you're lying to yourself and you're perpetuating the system that is going to kill another Breonna taylor and going to enable another cop to kill another Breonna Taylor and then he'll go to jail and or, or not. Like the idea that the only cop who got charged in this entire thing is the least responsible of the three for the death of Breonna Taylor. And the charges are for shooting a wall. Mm -hmm. It was more illegal in this situation for the cop to shoot a wall than it was for him to shoot Breonna Taylor. Mm -hmm. It's so insulting. And, and it's the insult. It's the system that enables that and these charges and the lack of accountability and the judge isn't going to pay a penalty. You just go, what? So let me explain to you why most of you are completely wrong about the facts around Breonna Taylor as eloquently put by a person who knows what they're talking about in Radley Balco. And I'll put this article in there. Stop making yourself look like a fool on the internet because you it's just, Oh, it's so frustrating. It, that, like I just look at this and I go, all of this is preventable. The death of Breonna Taylor, the charges against the cops, the riots in Louisville, all of this is preventable. If we actually take the root problem seriously, but we don't do that. We argue over whether or not the shoot was justifiable or not. It's fucking ghoulish. So Brett Hankerson, Hankinson was uh, charged with wanton endangerment. And uh, Radley Balco says this was probably correct, as was the decision not to charge the other officers involved in the shooting. If ballistics had conclusively shown that one of the bullets from Hankinson's gun killed Taylor, he should be charged with reckless homicide. But according to Cameron, the AG of Kentucky, the bullets that struck Taylor could not be matched to Hankinson's gun. There's the problem. There's the problem that the police who conducted the raid were relying on a warrant produced by another officer, which was then signed by a judge. And so there were many flaws in this process. And so essentially, how do you prove that the bullets that entered Taylor's body were fired by the gun of the three officers? If your ballistics don't match it, like justice demands that you can't you can't just charge all three officers with murder. Well, we all we don't like this situation and we have no concrete evidence of which one of these three officers killed her, but we're just going to charge them anyways. That's an that that would be wrong in and of itself. Right. Like if it, it, it if you were in that situation, you got to put yourself in these mindsets. Right. Like if I were the officer, would I want to be charged with murder and then it's going to get overturned by the criminal justice system. So why even fight that? Right. The problem, the root of the problem is why were they where, there and how did it happen? So 
there's there's a lot of criticism that goes along here. Um, you know, Cameron himself, the AG, was selective in what information he released in that press conference, which is why many people are asking what information was selectively hidden from the grand jury. And that information is not being released. And so you're going to see increasing calls for the grand jury testimony and all of that information to be released. Cameron's not going to want to do that because he wants to run for governor or Senate or something bigger than AG. And so he's not going to want that out there. Um, so furthermore, Balco writes, Taylor's death was not, as Cameron suggested, simply a tragedy for which no one is to blame. The police work in this case was sloppy and the warrant service was reckless. Taylor is dead because of a cascade of errors, bad judgment, and a dereliction of duty. And it's important to be clear about the facts. So the first myth that he takes on is that this was, this was not a no-knock warrant. It was absolutely a no-knock warrant. It says it on the warrant, if you look at the warrant. The portion of the warrant authorizing a no-knock entry cited an and put in paint from the full warrant plan that day. A no-knock warrant is an incredibly serious warrant that is issued by a police department for executing. It, it should be a last resort because these are violent drug criminals. Everybody's got an Uzi on the other side of the door. The prosecutors and everybody involved just copied and pasted information from four different warrants and the judge just signed off on them. So the uh, this is a violation of a requirement set by the Supreme Court that no knock warrants should be granted when police can present evidence that a particular suspect is a risk to shoot at police and destroy evidence if they knock and announce. They didn't do that. They didn't produce that evidence. The police claim they were told after the fact to disregard the no knock portion and instead knock and announce themselves because by at that point someone had determined that Taylor was a quote soft target. And not a threat. So they were supposed to knock. She was not a threat and not a major player in the drug investigation. But there were problems with this account. If Taylor was a soft target, why not surround the house, get a megaphone, and ask her to come out with her hands up? Why still take down the door with a battering ram? And why still serve the warrant in the middle of the night if she wasn't an imminent threat for which the no-knock warrant is designed? And why it is a last resort governed by Supreme Court rulings? Another myth, the police knocked and announced themselves and a witness heard them. This was the most frustrating part of this entire uh, press conference because he cited a single witness who claimed to have heard the officers identify themselves as police. Taylor's lawyers, who was the boyfriend the how, at the house that fired the gun, Taylor's lawyers say, um, and let me say his first name just so I have it, uh, Excuse me, Brianna Taylor. I'm sorry, her boyfriend comes into play later. Um, Kenneth Walker. Kenneth Walker's the boy. So, um, Taylor, Brianna Taylor's family's lawyers, uh, interviewed 11 of her neighbors, many living in the same apartment building as Taylor. According to the lawyers, no neighbor heard an announcement. The New York Times interviewed 12 neighbors, they found one, just one, who heard the announcement. And he only heard one announcement from the police. He also told the paper, with all the commotion, it's entirely possible that Walker and Taylor didn't hear that announcement. Cameron neglected to mention any of this. Cameron is the AG. Moreover, in a CNN interview Wednesday night, Walker, the boyfriend that was there that fired the gun, said the witness to whom Cameron was referring initially said he did not hear the police announce themselves. He repeated that he didn't hear anything in the second interview with police. And it was only after his third interview that he finally said he heard somebody announce. That's critical context that Cameron, A.G. Cameron, completely neglected to give. So even Kenneth Walker, the boyfriend, has admitted that the police pounded on the door for 30 to 45 seconds. Therefore, by nef definition, this was not a no-knock raid. So with a few exceptions when conducting a raid, government agents must knock and announce their presence purpose and give anyone inside the opportunity to let officers in peacefully. 
thus avoiding violence completely to the person and the destruction of property. If the police simply pounded on the door for 45 seconds and never appropriately announced themselves, that's even worse than knocking at all because it makes Walker and Taylor even more fearful inside that people were outside to do them harm. Mm -hmm. So if the police say they announced themselves and one neighbor heard it, then they probably did. So what if the other neighbors didn't hear it? Well, this is the entire purpose of the knock and announce requirement. It's to uh, provide ample evidence to everybody in the house to come out peacefully. And so if they, I, I live in an apartment complex and there's four doors right outside the doors here. If that were taking place, I could hear it in my bedroom even if I were asleep. You hear this in, the, in an apartment complex. Any of us who have lived in an apartment complex understand this. If the police didn't yell loudly and clearly who they were, loud enough for the people inside to hear, the knock and announce portion is rendered completely meaningless and the entire action becomes no different than a no-knock raid. As the Times reported, the officers on this raid were trained by the man who is now the president of the Louisville City Council. He says... He told a local paper during his 19 year career as a police officer, he had instructed recruits at the local training academy about dynamic entry, especially when executing a warrant at night. He told the police to yell police at the top of their lungs specifically so that the occupants would not mistake them for an intruder. Now, the next myth is that Brianna Taylor was asleep in her bed when she was shot. It's true that she was not in her bed and, and shot and killed while asleep. Uh, many reports of from the media and activists claim that is true. That's they were in their bed when the police began pounding on the door. They were awakened at 12:40 a.m. and there's every reason to believe Walker when he says they were frightened. The man who shot the police, the next myth is, is Brianna Taylor's boyfriend that he was a drug dealer. Taylor's ex-boyfriend was dealing the drugs. A man named Jamarcus Glover who was the main focus of the police investigation. They were on again, off again. He was a bad guy that many of her family did not like. She had blocked him from her phone. She was trying to get away from this man. He was clearly a dangerous individual. The man in the Walker was her current boyfriend, not her drug dealing boyfriend. Okay. He was not named in the investigation whatsoever. So, a few people have pointed to a leaked police memo that includes quotes from Glover taken from recorded phone conversations at the jail as proof that the two knew one another. The Louisville police themselves have said that the leaked memo was an early unverified draft written mid investigation that these quotes were taken out of context and that they were being used as deeply misleading. For example, Glover said Walker was also in jail. He was because police had arrested him after the raid. The next myth is that Brianna Taylor's ex-boyfriend implicated her in his drugs dealing. The Times reported that according to friends and family Taylor's social media posts, she was on again and off again with Glover, who friends and family and Taylor herself thought was bad for her, and Walker, who said they say treated her well and was, by all accounts, a good and decent man. Glover was in and out of jail, and Taylor paid his bail more than once. his bail. She seemed to genuinely care, care for Glover, implicated in the investi investigation and she but she was trying to extricate herself from uh Glover's life there are a few other instances in the warrant that have some have some have said implicated Taylor in December 2016 she rented a car and loaned it to Glover he then loaned it to a man involved in his drug dealing and that man was found dead in the car but police who were investigated were satisfied that Taylor had no knowledge of the murder or of how Glover and the used car when she loaned it to him would be used in this incident. And the other incident occurred two months before the raid when Glover retrieved the package he had ordered delivered to Brianna Taylor's home. The police claimed a postal inspector told them this package was suspicious. The postal inspector later said he has no record of that. And according to the attorneys for Brianna Taylor's family, the package contained clothes and shoes. Some again have pointed to that leaked memo in which Glover seemed to suggest storing money at Taylor's apartment, but the police found no cash at the apartment. Glover has also said since publicly that Taylor had no involvement in his drug dealing. The, the quote-unquote criminal, Glover said she wasn't involved after her passing. 
and he may have some incentive to say otherwise. In July, attorneys for Taylor's family say prosecutors presented Glover with a plea bargain that listed Taylor as a co-defendant. The city of Louisville, the prosecutors, the police were trying to implicate Breonna Taylor in all of this to cover their asses and they they gave him a plea deal that if he just copped to that he would get he would get a lighter sentence he would get reduced charges if he implicated her prosecutors for their credit say the plea deal was just a draft though taylor's family's attorneys say that claim is dubious glover declined that plea deal he said i'm not going to do that so some people have said the judge who signed the warrant is not to blame it was signed by Louisville Circuit Judge Mary Shaw. The portion of the warrant affidavit that requested a no-knock raid was the exact same language used in the other four warrants. It stated that drug dealers are dangerous and might dispose of evidence if police knock and announce. It contained no particularized information as to why Taylor herself was dangerous or presented such a threat. And that, according to the Supreme Court, is not su sufficient to grant a no-knock warrant. Yet Shaw granted it anyways. Perhaps she provided more she perhaps she provided more scrutiny to the other parts of the affidavit, but she did not ask for more evidence in the no-knock warrant portion, and she should have. The only possible defense of Shaw here is that, as regular readers of Balco know, judges seem to grant no-knock warrants when they aren't merited and in defiance of the Supreme Court precedent with regularity. And there's no harm done if the no-knock position of the warrant is illegal because the same Supreme Court who has said the exclusionary rule doesn't apply, and that is precisely the problem. So the, another myth. If Kenneth Walker hadn't shot at the cops, Breonna Taylor would still be alive. Walker admits he fired first. Remember, this is the good guy boyfriend. But he says he fired only after he and Taylor repeatedly asked who was pounding at the door, got no answer, and after a battering ram busted open the door. If Walker reasonably believed that the men breaking into the apartment were not the police, he had every right to defend himself and Taylor. At this point, the police had the right to return fire. The latter would be true even if the courts later determined that the police had failed to properly identify themselves. The law protects the cops, so even if they don't follow the procedures correctly and they bust into your house and you start shooting at the cops, they have a right to shoot back. And if they kill you, they're not going to prison. That's why you saw a guy just shoot, go to get a, a class D felony for shooting at the wall, but not Breonna Taylor's body. There's every reason to believe that Walker didn't know the men outside. Walker is not a criminal. There were no drugs in the house. You don't need to own, a, have a license to own a gun in a private home in Kentucky, but Walker had gone the extra step of getting a concealed carry license. That isn't something that hardened criminals held in on killing cops tend to do. Neither is calling 911, which Walker did after the shooting. Moreover, Walker knew about Taylor's past involvement with the drug dealer Glover and that Glover wasn't happy about him and Taylor seeing each other. He said he had feared that it was Glover or his associates outside the door. That seems totally reasonable. The really sad part about this is that Cameron's misleading statement about the witness who heard the police announce, along with the fact that Walker filed first, has led some to put the blame on for Taylor's death on Walker. What Walker did that night was what any one of us would do. What every conservative tough guy on our social media says is that if you come into my house, I'm going to shoot my guns at you. I don't care who you are. I'm, I'm shooting first and asking questions second. He wanted to protect the woman that he wanted to marry. He wanted to protect his property. You'll make all the excuses for Kyle Rittenhouse, but not one for Walker. You'll lie about Breonna Taylor and then call yourself a free thinker. Fucking despicable. So you can't just ignore this stuff because this tragedy has so many layers of problems around it. Questions of why serve a warrant in the middle of the night on a witness tangential to an investigation? Why did the police alter the times on their reports? The most recent activity involving Taylor on the search warrants was in January. Why wait until March to serve the warrant on her apartments? Why didn't police do any further investigation to better establish how involved the drug conspiracy Taylor really was? To simply blow this for which no one is to blame is an insult and to the life and legacy of Breonna Taylor, but also who have been gunned down in their homes before her and will be gunned down in the future, I might add.
And the effort by Cameron and others to make all of this go away by feeding the public half truths that blame the victims in the story, Taylor and Walker, who are innocent victims in this, for Breonna Taylor's death is inexcusable. Bradley Balco writes, we could prevent the next Breonna Taylor. We could ban forced entry raids to serve drug warrants. We could hold judges accountable for signing warrants that don't pass constitutional muster. We could demand that police officers wear body cameras during these raids to hold them accountable and that they be adequately punished when they fail to activate them. We could do a lot to make sure there are no more, more Breonna Taylors. The question is whether we want to. It's clear that no one being willing to do that. You'd rather lie about the death of a black person than actually take any of this seriously. And it's the fact that she's black that a lot of you seem to have a problem with, that you'll make up bullshit. But then when Kyle Rittenhouse does what he does, you'll make every excuse in the world for him. He didn't do anything wrong. You'll lick the boots of every cop and, and, and prosecutor imaginable to make excuses for Breonna Taylor dying. You don't give a shit. It fucking pisses me off. And then you have the audacity to ask, why are people in the streets protesting? Well, we've been talking about this for 30 fucking years. Libertarians have been on the forefront of civil liberties and fighting for this stuff. And then when we are at a moment where the majority of America is ready to make a change, you just start licking those boots. You just go, the cops didn't do anything wrong. She, oh, she, she was a drug dealer. You spread fake fucking news. And then you, you literally spread the sa you verify the whole Russia bullshit that we've been arguing about for three years because you're just buying into state propaganda. And just because it's repeated over and over and over and you've got Ben Shapiro and the Daily Wire and these conservative news sites repeating the lie over and over, that doesn't make it true. There's real facts here that you can fucking see. What is wrong? I don't. What is wrong with people, Reinhold? I don't. Like everybody's in agreement except for the politician that's lying. And then everybody just repeats lies back to me. And then they go, Why are you mad about this? Well, it's an us versus them type of mentality. But there's something that's really interesting too is a lot of the people who are claiming that uh, the, the police weren't wrong in anything they did here are also people who call themselves patriots. And if you go back and look at what that word supposedly meant so the, back when that kind of that kind of word was used in the american revolution the patriots were the ones who were fighting against the government oppression the no knock raiding basically the the unwarranted searching of people's homes the what what the government was doing against them right the the patriots the one fighting against that whereas the tories were the ones who were supporting the government you know England and saying that the that the you know do, basically doing the same thing that these people who call themselves patriots to do it. These are the people who were supporting England during the Revolutionary War. This is exactly what they're doing. You can't call yourself a patriot if you're not going to fight against overreach by the government. And make no mistake about it, all of this is overreach by the government. There's no excuses for people for for this situation to have happened. There, there's literally every bad decision was made and bad system was put in place to, to allow that to occur. We, we uh, demonize people who are not even, you know, found guilty of any kind of crime or even suspected of, you know, it, we, we demonize them as criminals. You know, people are calling the, uh, the boyfriend, a criminal, he should have had a gun, fell on buzz. It, they got it all wrong. And, and, it, it's it's so frustrating to see that because um, these are the people who are also trying to claim that. So a great example in, in something that I saw recently. So a woman gets arrested at a, a, a game of some sort. I remember what kind of the football game, basketball game, or not those outside event, right? Because, because she was trespassing because she didn't want to wear her mask. They asked her to leave. She said she wasn't going to leave. Therefore she was trespassing. So they came and grabbed her and they forcibly removed her. And there's a video of a relative or a friend or something 
uh, for this person who was so incensed about this that he went down to the police station and he's filing out a report and he's videotaping the whole thing saying, you know, I'm usually for the police and backing the blue and respect everything I do, but this time they went too far. And it's like, <laughs> that was, so, you know, as soon as some of these people run into injustice from the government, all of a sudden you know, they become, you know, I want to have a protest and we should have this guy fired and this is all should be changed. But when it happens to other people, apparently it's not important enough for that to happen. They're going to defend the police against all of that. And it's, we've militarized the police. We've, we've put so many laws in place that the police can basically target somebody and just do it. There was a, um, a program in a city recently where I think it was in Tucson or somewhere that um, they were trying to precognition whether or not somebody would 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 commit a crime so they were putting these you know this computer program together and they identified these people and said well we think that they might become criminals one day so they started harassing them and trying to find anything they could find to get them behind bars on on any technicality well there's so many laws on the books that that becomes easy to do so we you had families just being harassed by the police department and having done nothing wrong at all, you know, completely innocent of everything. And um, that's how the system gets abused. And we want to talk about, well, okay, this is just a case of uh, overambitious uh, policing, and it's not about a race issue. That's true, and it's also false, right? So there are truths that the government, that the police will over police. Uh, on these drug things and, and they're trying to make quotas and and they'll violate rights of individuals all the time but there's also the aspect that in that situation you can look at the numbers that the statistics supposedly show that the black people are creating or committing more crimes well they're not committing more crimes they're just getting punished for the crimes they're, they're the ones being sought after because the statistics say that so it's like a it's like a, a feedback loop mm -hmm. that reinforces this, this notion that just not true. When you look at the actual data, you know, people go, well, look at the FBI crime statistics. I thought we weren't listening to the government. I thought the government was lying to us. Mm -hmm. Now you want to believe the FBI statistics and you don't even do any research into what the FBI statistics say and why they say what they say, because you want to use those to defend the government's, continuing to 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 violate the rights of these people right and it's 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 maddening because these are the people who supposedly call themselves patriots and they're not they're the exact opposite yeah they'll find that right data here. point that they have they'll find that data point and they'll grab onto it you know without looking at the 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 system the statistics that was used to make that type of report it is the sickening thing with uh, the brianna taylor thing that was already got me is as a gun owner you go through your gun training that you know you're regardless of what's going on like you can defend your house you're still responsible for all these the bullets that are coming out the, the your gun you know you're responsible for every one of those you know so and it just shows that Kenneth Walker was held responsible for his bullets coming out, but they weren't held responsible. You know, they, they shot someone who was shooting back at them. That's the thing they always got. It's like, okay, but she mm -hmm. shooting. It's, it's like, yeah. so you're not responsible for the bullets leaving your gun. You know, so, so if you have, you have reckless endangerment because you're shooting at somebody uh, at a wall that might affect a neighbor who's not involved. And why would you also not get, reckless endangerment for finding somebody who's not attacking you who's not right. being violent against you who's not a danger to you right. right and it's we we give the the police this you know he's going for the gun and that's their excuse now they carry you know drop guns they do all these things to to make the shooting good in their minds mm -hmm. but they're not taking the time to say maybe i should wait a second more correct you know let me wait till I'm actually in some sort of danger. You mm -hmm. know, there's video of a, a, a guy who had gone on a high speed chase. Uh, they got him into a parking lot of a, a, a store and uh, 
he gets out of the car and he's complying with everything that they're asking him to do. They tell him to get on the ground. He gets on the ground. They tell him to roll over. He rolls over. They tell him to put his hands in the air. Then they tell him to stand up. You know, that he's done everything that they've asked him to do at that point. So he's no longer an active danger to anybody. He's not driving the car and hurting anybody. He's, he's complying with their law, with what they're telling him to do. And they release dogs on him. Right. And he had done a literally nothing wrong. And they're like, well, he kind of hesitated. He showed you he had no gun. He had lifted up his shirt and proved he had no gun on. He was no danger to you whatsoever. And you still release the dogs on him and let the dog chew on him for a, a full minute while you're trying to tie, you know, and he's screaming, let get the dog off me, help me get the dog off me. And they were just telling the dog, good boy, you know, and it, nobody's outraged, you know, and, and, and it's like we said, we, they've been marching in the streets. They've been having protests. Look what happened to Kaepernick when he was trying to make a point. He was trying to get attention to the issue. It just devolves, you know? So what, at what point, you know, I don't think they should ever go into a violent situation. I don't think I don't support violence, but at some point you have to understand their frustration, right? You have to understand the frustration and feelings where it's like, this is an oppressive government to these people. It's the same mentality as the people like, the anti mass it's just amazing to me that the anti mass crowd who marched in the streets in April doesn't understand the the Black Lives Matter protesters who marched in the streets in July. Right. Like the point is that the boot of the neck of the government, the boot of the government is on the neck of the people. Mm -hmm. Like people are saying rightly, you don't have the right to close down my business and destroy my life. And they're saying you don't have the right to destroy my life and then nobody's held accountable a wall is more valuable to the state of kentucky than the body of brianna taylor and then we look at them and say you don't have a right to be offended by that mm -hmm. and then they look at us and go you don't have a right to be offended by your business being closed down the problem is not like we're sitting here buying into the propaganda of the president who wants to pit each other pit us against each other like People go, well, you have you are you have Trump derangement syndrome. And you go, that is the president, the head of the government, trying to maintain power by any means necessary. And his chief tool is pitting you against me so we don't look at him and go, they're the problem. The system is the problem. The government is the problem. The one thing that this government does not want is Black Lives Matter and the Tea Party marching together against them. So they pit us against each other. And the media just, all right, we're going to get all kinds of great ratings out of this fight because it's the Colosseum. It's the same ghoulish mentality of our Roman forefathers who are watching cops and black people shoot each other and fight it out. And which, what, which team am I on? And people who are police officers and people of color and people involved in the, who pay the cost of the drug war all going, please listen to us and stop voting this way. Help, help, help. And then we go, I'm sorry, I can't listen to you. I've got to argue over whether or not the cops are better than black people. I, I, I and I don't get why people are they like it's not liberal it's not leftist to go I get why the black community is tired of laws oppressing them because the the Michigan protesters who are bringing their guns are tired of being oppressed too like and I know that there's not not a moral equivalence between generations of having that boot on your neck and six weeks of having that boot on your neck so I'm not trying to say that I want but I'm trying to get the people who are protesting the mask laws to understand why their fellow Americans and fellow human beings who want to be recognized as more valuable than a wall are protesting. And, and then you don't listen and don't change the system because you've got the convenient out of the rioters who are different than the protesters, but you don't give a fuck because you've got permission to not care because they destroyed property. It just pisses me off. It's outrageous. Like as libertarians, our goal should be when the boot of the neck is on the when the boot of the state is on the neck of our fellow citizens, we should fight for them. And I don't I'm not buying into the leftist, the anti-left bull. Oh well, we 
we should allow Donald Trump to destroy the system and completely lie about ballots so he can maintain power because th if we don't destroy the system, they're going to destroy the system. Yeah, I never got this. This, <laughs> this whole, you know, a so we got people who are anti Marxist or anti leftist or anti commies or whatever. Right. And they're going, well, Black Lives Matter is a, is a Marxist organization, therefore we're not going to support it. Like, I don't care if, you know, they were Satanist or whatever. What, what are, if the point they're making is valid, the point they're making is valid. It doesn't matter. If it's that organization or a different, or, you know, we don't approve of that organization. Therefore, we're just not going to support the cause that they're actually fighting for. It makes no sense whatsoever. You know, that's that's excusism. That's, you know, we're supposed to be individualists. Right. And we're supposed to look at things in an individualist type of thing and not group people together into groups. And the first thing that happens is uh, people start saying all oh, the riots are causing this issue. Therefore, you know, the whole movement is, is invalid and we should ignore them. Right. It, it, it that doesn't have, so in every peaceful transition of, of, you know, progress that's happened, let's see, you can go back to Gandhi, you can go to Martin Luther King, all of those situations, there was violence involved in some way or form in those fights. You know, Martin Luther King was just trying to say, we shouldn't be, um, being violent but there were still some violent actions taking place and people were blaming him for causing the violence because he was out there protesting and and basically giving them cause to do so and even in the revolutionary war there you know before the war even started there were people who were as i said before you know the the patriots and the tories and there were Patriots who were actually tar and feathering. That's where this phrase tar and feathering came from was a revolution was pre-revolutionary war where they were taking Tories and they were throwing, you know, oils on them and, and hitting them with feathers and they were destroying their businesses and they were uh, burning down their homes and chased 80,000 people out of the country and fled to Canada and other places just to get away from the harassment that they were under under. Because we were trying to fight against the government and the, you know, the net result of when things get that bad is that some people decide to, to resort to violence because of emotions and, and feeling helpless and, and feeling like they were being oppressed and, and they're being attacked because of that. So they had to, their defense is to fight back. So I, I prefer that they didn't do that because it does muddy the, the messaging but I also I'm not going to discount what they are saying, what the majority of these people are saying, just because you have outliers of people, uh, 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 10, 5, 10 percent of the people who are getting mad and are trying to be heard. And they're, so they're setting fire to things. I mean, they're, they're, it's wrong, but it's also understandable. And it doesn't invalidate the message. It doesn't invalidate what is happening that anybody can look at and see individuals separate those two separate those two people separate yeah. the protesters from the criminals the people who are committing criminal acts but most people don't want to because then you know so are uh okay so uh well, you, 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 just michael one thing perry, before one thing actually, before michael so. perry makes a good point here he goes this is why they should turn off cell service during these riots i agree like some of this is performative yeah but it's also that you had you had those three people was it five people who stood outside the 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 hospital when the two police were shot right and they were saying somebody said yeah we will hope they die it was one person there were five people there protesting it was one person who said it on camera and all of a sudden Joe Biden wants the police to die right? <laughs> it's the propaganda within a day I'm right. like that's that's they're, you're being used you know. Don't fall for that stuff. Yeah, and the Very. one thing, like, uh, with help propelled um, Dr. Martin Luther King to the forefront of the civil rights movement was the simple fact because they were trying to make sure that this movement is violence. So the only way to do it was get a leader, push everyone, just like, nope, we're going to be peaceful, we're going to walk. This was like, we have to showcase that we're peaceful, we want to get our message across, and the people who are being violent are the people who dislike our message. So we're going to show up at, on our Sunday's best, on our Sunday best, and we're just going to walk. Mm -hmm. This is how we're going to do our protest now, because anyone doing something regardless, different than us, it's not with us. And that's one thing that, I like, I get the leaderless movement thing. Trust me, I, I, I like the spontaneous order about it. 
but you will get people who just will just say they are part of this structure coming down there and they will be and sometimes they're just bad actors or grifters just trying to get something there's a great show oh go ahead harry sorry and that's one thing that like black lives matter like the the organization is doing as a good idea like this is what it is but they need to push someone on the forefront and can try to for a lack of a better term, control or try to funnel the mo- like their protest. Like, nope, this is how we're going to protest. We're going to protest peacefully and show up in your Sunday's best. I'm sorry. This is what we're going to have to do. So we can tell them, nope, you're not with us. You know how I know you're not with us? You look like trash. You're wearing denim. We told no one to wear denim. Yeah, so um, there's a great show on Showtime. I pay Amazon Prime for the Showtime subscription solely for the circus and PBS for 60 minutes because I'm an 80-year-old man. Um, but the circus is a bunch of reporters that travel around and do like on the ground immersive journalism on video. And they went to Kenosha and at the end he's talking to, um, and the ballot one, we'll play an audio clip of it next week. It's great. Um, but we're going to talk about all the mail fraud and the basically Donald Trump's complete lies (laughs) in a couple episodes uh, next weekend. Um, because he's just lying to win re-election and y'all are falling for it. And I, I just, again, it's going to be an, another angry episode. I apologize if I've been too much, but I, I this just it's pent up rage for a week on this. Um, but they, they interview a guy who's been head of the black lives matter movement in Milwaukee. And he's like, we don't want any of this. We go home and we're in bed by the time these people are destroying this stuff. It makes us look terrible. You know, Daily Caller's on the ground in Louisville the other night, and I'm watching on Twitter. There's a clip from the Daily Caller reporter, one of them that got arrested. Police arrested them, even though they said they were journalists. And Ali Velshi and all these other journalists from around the world said, yep, these Daily Caller journalists should not have been arrested. It was nice, nice mending fences a little bit. This guy pulls out a gun. And all of a sudden, all the other people rush the guy with the gun and take his gun away and make him leave. If you watch, and and maybe that's why they shouldn't turn the cell service off, because when you actually watch the video of what's happening on the ground, the narrative from the right about these protests and the president is completely blown apart. It's, It's really what individualists like libertarians often say. There are a thousand different motivations in a crowd of a thousand people for being there. And to block all of them as one group of individuals. It's it's why I hated it. I hated when the Tea Party got like I lost it on the the a, a forthcoming episode of the the Pat Down where Miss Pat says I'm a racist for being a part of the Tea Party, and I was just like, how fucking dare you? You know what I mean? Like I just it, it, everybody shows up to the Tea Party rallies ten years ago with different motivations. The QAnon conspiracy nut at the anti-mask protest standing next to the small business owner that's angry about his investment being destroyed have two very different motivations. And you get mad at the New York Times when they conflate the two. Um, I will say this. I want to, you know, a lot of great comments. I want to thank Ethan Bishop Hinchman for saying Gorsuch is an Episcopalian. Kagan is Jewish. And then everybody else is a Catholic on the court. Um, Warren B says it's a sad chain of events. Thanks for the breakdown, Chris. That's the most thorough one I've heard. As someone who lives in Kentucky, I get my news from a guy in Indiana. Um, Jericho writes, to be fair, people are so used to being indoctrinated into being free thinkers and independent researchers that they believe the quick post and info they see on the Internet. It's sort of difficult to sort out the real facts as lay people. You have to know where your reliable sources are. Thanks for helping out with that with Wall. I will share this podcast. If you share the podcast during election season, you are forever my hero. That's the best way we grow. Um, 